Dan I'm Danielle Sarnoff, the director of IDRF, and my colleagues Isha and Ryan, who are um, program assistants, as well as Elsa Ransom, who is the uh, associate director, um, will be with us. So um, to be clear, I just want to, I'm going to go through a number of slides. Uh, the first few of them are sort of overviews of the mandate, um, overviews and mandate of the program. Um, I don't know how much time people have spent going so thoroughly through our website. I know all of you, of course, got invitations because you um, have initial interest. So um, perhaps some of this you already know, but I think better uh, to go through it and be um, be clear than to uh, than to have misunderstanding. Um, and then um, once I go through some of that, I will uh, go into more depth on the um, application, um, different parts of it, including uh, the review process for IDRF. So uh, the program um, is designed to support noted here, the next generation of scholars in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Um, we are specifically interested in um, supporting research that advances knowledge either about non-US cultures um, or US indigenous cultures, right? So those are sort of the two aspects of it. Um, we support site-specific um, on-site research. And what you have there then in the parentheses is an attempt to capture the range of disciplinary methods, right? Whether it's field work, archival um, research, manuscript collections that you'll be looking at, data collection, a whole range of, uh, of different areas. So again, um, you might be doing mixed methods or you might have a very specific disciplinary method. And we're just trying to capture the range of that from the humanities uh, through the humanistic social sciences. Um, we have been around for quite a while. We're moving into our say 24th year um, and we have at this point in fact um, supported more than 1600 projects um, and when we say research span the globe I mean it's true and it's a nice sort of um, bumper sticker um, but indeed we will send you any place and as I uh, make clear to folks we'll send you places the state department won't send you um, which um, is also to serve um, a a way of noting that we'll send you to a range of places that um, often actually have warnings or uh, concerns about them. And I'll talk more about that in a moment if you um, if you think you're going to a place with, with those sort of challenges um, that you should probably address that in some way in your application. As it's noted, we are funded by the, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and um, uh, there'll be a couple of spots in this uh, presentation where um, the interests of our funder, who many of you may know is uh, often primarily an arts and humanities funder, um, are, um, are indicated, right? Or um, there are parts of our application in which the funder's interest um, is made clearer to you. So I will draw your attention to that as well. Um, so some basic aspects of program eligibility. Um, it's noted it's for graduate students in humanities and humanistic social sciences. You must be enrolled in a PhD program in the United States. Um, you do not need to be a US citizen, right? So as long as you're enrolled in a, in a PhD program in, at an institution in the United States, um, that, is, uh, that is enough. You do not need to be a, a US citizen. Um, so you do not need to be ABD um, while when you're applying, you do not need to be ABD as you're waiting to hear from us. Indeed, you don't need to be ABD um, even in when you do hear from us. Um, but um, to be clear, we will not send you any money and you will not formally be starting this fellowship until you're ABD. The earliest you could start your research um, for the 2022 cohort, which is what we're talking about today, would be July 1, 2022. Um, and the latest you could start it would be the end of December, 2022. So when we say here, sort of whichever comes first is that if you plan to do research um, before, um, if you plan to do research starting July 1, 2022, you need to be ABD by then, right? And so you must start your research sometime between July 1 and, and the end of December 22. So somewhere in there, before we send you money, before you can start your research, you must be ABD and we will ask for um, a letter um, from your advisor confirming that, right? Um, so while, as I said, that uh, we are a fellowship that supports people working on non-US cultures or 
on US uh, or and with US indigenous um, communities, um, you could also have the US as a case for comparative inquiry, right? So we uh, do consider those working on the US as one component of a comparative. Uh, we do consider that eligible. I want to just unpack this aspect for a, a little bit, right? So first of all, as it notes there, for those conducting research on topics within Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islanders, um, the IDRF will fund research both on, um, on Native lands, both in terms of the specificity of lands that are designated reservation through sovereignty treaties. We certainly acknowledge that. Um, that um, relationship, but also beyond that, right, to, as it's noted here, places and spaces that are located within U.S. and territorial jurisdictions, right? So we have a much more capacious understanding um, of or acceptance um, of what we mean um, by, you, by Native territory um, or Indigenous territory, right? So it's not simply reservation lands. For those who are not working um, with U.S. Indigenous topics, um, you must be working on a topic that is um, non-US or comparative, right? So at least you know half of this needs to be non-US, right? Um, and you would need and you would require international site-specific research if you are not working on a US indigenous topic. Um, so I went, I'll go into some detail about um, those, some of those aspects also um, in terms of how much. US time and things like that, but um, just to be clear on that. Um, and also, of course, then just to be clear, right, everyone is either working, um, but the, everybody working on a non-US topic could have a US component, right? Um, so and there may be US, there may be non-US topics that require benefit from US-based sources, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And I want to just emphasize here, as I will on a number of occasions, that if you're in doubt, right, about your eligibility, please email us, right, idrf at ssrc.org. Um, better for you, better for everyone to email us, um, checking on your eligibility before you, in, you know, start this, right? This is a significant endeavor. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. We don't want you to waste your time uh, if you wouldn't be eligible. So please email us um, ahead of time. Um, we'd much rather clarify it then than to make you ineligible after, after you apply. Uh, so a couple of basic um, aspects also of the fellowship um, for this 2022 competition. We are will be able to offer 60 fellowships of approximately $23,000. Um, you do not apply with a budget. Please don't send a budget <laughs> with your application. Uh, if you become a fellow, uh, we will work with you on a budget. Um, and to be clear, of course, I give the number 23,000. It's understandable. People have an interest in knowing what the potential funding is. Um, but um, also to be clear, it's not a guaranteed minimum, uh, nor is it an absolute maximum. Um, it depends on where you're going, for how long, um, and what other funding you have, right? If you're going for six months versus 12 months of some place, you're going to a less expensive um, place versus a much more costly place. Um, and as I mentioned, other funding, I mean, you are permitted to hold the IDRF with other fellowships. Um, and so this is part of what we will work with you um, on if you become a fellow and to be clear, no place, uh, no funding organization will allow you to quote, you know, double dip, that is get the same, um, have the same budget line and get it from multiple sources. Um, so a part of the working with you would be to, to, um, to balance those kinds of requests across different funding organizations, right? And so also part of what I'm saying here is, you know, we are happy to be able to give a little more money to some to some folks for whom SS, uh, SSG and IDRF are their only funders, right? Um, and so that makes, that is becomes more possible because others might get less funding because they have happily for them more abundant funding um, when they include other, other funders, right? So that is part of our sort of desire to spread the love here on a fairly limited resource um, in terms of dissertation funding. Everyone's doing six to 12 months of research. Um, and I will explain the, the next sentence in, in a moment, but yes, three to 12 months of international research depending on your discipline. Um, so I'll, I'll go into further depth about that. But again, everyone is requesting six to 12 months of site-specific research time. This is not a write-up grant. This is not a like, oh, I did my research last year and I want to and do analysis or um, confer with my advisor um, and um, you know have an outline of my chapters, right? This is very specifically 
uh, it's in the <laughs> in the title for research, right? Uh, as I mentioned, right, we're talking about the 2022 cohort, and um, as I said, the earliest you could start your research um, would be July 1st, 2022. Um, the latest you could start it, as I mentioned in the previous slide, would be December, at the end of December 2022. And it, the idea would be it would be six to 12 months, depending on what you have requested, um, of continuous research, right? So um, maybe you start in July and you only, you know, you, or, and you're requesting 12 months. So you would be July 2022 to uh, July 2023, right? And so obviously everyone can do the math in terms of you have to start within a certain time frame and it's continuous six to 12 months and everybody would therefore be done by December of 2023, right? So to be clear about that. Um, and just to let you know, the fellowship does include an interdisciplinary workshop upon the completion of the IDRF funded research. Um, this is separate from the, um, the awards funds from the 23,000 average that I mentioned above, just so people know we're not pulling from that. Um, and then also um, we, um, we have, Oh, for many years, of course, had them in person. Uh, currently, we're having them virtually, but we certainly hope that um, by any of you who'd be in this cohort, that they would be back in person again. Um, and given that, of course, that introduces the, uh, the looming background to all of our lives, um, the past year and a half, which is COVID, I wanted to mention a little something about the, um, the expectation or not um, about um, about COVID and all of this. We are not asking uh, 2022 applicants to have a COVID backup plan, right? That is to say, um, po possibly out of a combination of, I don't know, optimism and perhaps naivete. Um, we are hoping that since we said the earliest any um, anybody on this fellowship could start would be July, 2022, that by then, um, international um, or US-based research would be at something approaching normal. I also, of course, am hesitant to make any sorts of predictions about anything um, in, in life or the world. Um, but um, on, this, on this particular aspect of the fellowship uh, of the application, we're saying you do not have to have, as I said, a backup plan, a plan B in case uh, the impact of COVID continues to um, be felt, right? I mean, obviously it will be felt in some, in some ways. Um, and we will inform review, reviewers as they are reading that it should just be based on, I guess, on the COVID side, best case scenarios. But of course, there are other factors um, that can be challenging um, and can disrupt your plans um, that are not about COVID, right? And so I sort of hinted at that when I said we will send people anywhere to do research. So if you are going somewhere um, where the research is... Um, well, we're a reader, right? A scholar um, with or without particular expertise of that, of that area would say, wow, it's really quite difficult to do research in this area, or it's incredibly um, difficult to get a visa there if you're a citizen of numerous countries, right? Um, or, um, you know, what about the fact that this place has been recently hit by a natural disaster? Does that have an impact on access to people, organizations, um, archives, things like that? Um, security challenges, uh, the whole range of things that, of course, you know, are going on all over the globe and the places you may be interested in working in um, at all times. So if you are planning to do research in a place um, that you think someone would raise a question about, and also that you yourself are aware of, of course, um, I would urge you not to be sort of a naive uh, researcher and just be like, oh, it's not gonna be a problem. I mean, I know there's what there's, I know there's civil war there, but I, I'm not gonna have a problem, right? And I don't mean to be flippant about the realities um, across the globe, but, but um, I'm urging you not to be naive about your presentation of yourself as a researcher, right? So acknowledge perhaps the challenges and explain why you um, would still have access to the kind of research you plan to undertake in those, in those areas. And we've certainly had folks, uh, as I said, we send folks anywhere, um, but um, you, part of the feasibility of your study is making an argument for why you have access to a place while others might say, I don't think there's easy access to this place, right? And again, we've certainly funded people who have made that, that argument and have made it convincingly and have managed to do their research, but um, it's just an exhortation to be aware of that. So I'm sort of saying, 
you don't have to worry about COVID, I mean, <laughs> on this topic, um, but you do have to think about the specifics of your research um, as it relates to feasibility and, um, and access. Okay, so on um, the previous slide, I said, you know, everyone's doing six to 12 months of on-site site-specific research, and I said three to um, 12 months of international research, depending on the discipline. So this is, this is the slide explaining more of that, right? Um, and part of this is indeed connected uh, to our funder, right? So um, the, the Mellon Foundation, as I mentioned, is deeply um, interested, concerned about the state of the humanities and um, wanted to be sure that folks within certain targeted humanities um, had access to and read themselves into this application. And part of the, one of the things that was raised over um, the years is that there are folks studying in these disciplines, these specific disciplines you see before you, um, who might be working on a non-US topic, um, but may not require um, so much, um, even six to 12 months of international research um, on those non-US topics, right? And so for those 11 disciplines, right? And just for these, um, you could have, uh, you could request as little as three months of international onsite research for your non-US topic, right? And the remainder, again, depending on how much of a, you know, how much time you're requesting um, could be in the US. So it's not that it's a US topic necessarily, um, but it's US based research on that non US topic. Folks in these disciplines, like any discipline, also, of course, can spend their entire time in the United States if they're working um, on a, a US indigenous topic, right? So I'm talking specifically about folks who are doing a, a non US topic and the relationship there to international um, onsite research. So again, sort of thinking about, this is one of these areas where uh, some of the distinctions within the um, fellowship have to do with a funder's interest, right? Wanting to make sure people who say work in art history, perhaps their museum holdings, curatorial records um, that uh, have access to in the United States, but it's on a non-US topic, right? <clears throat> um, so to, to unpack, um, but uh, one of the things I brought up earlier, and this is in distinction, I suppose, to everybody else, right? So again, those targeted humanities are only those on the previous slide. Everybody else um, has to have a, as a minimum um, of six months of international onsite research for their non-US topic, right? And um, to be clear, between the two slides, um, it covers most, though not all, um, of the dis disciplines that apply, right? So please, it's not an exhaustive list. If you're in humanities or, or social sciences, um, you are eligible. Um, it covers a lot of them, right? Um, and to be clear also, whether you're, uh, you're, whether you see your discipline on this slide or the previous slide, or again, not, not at all, um, everyone is applying for six to 12 months of on-site site specific research. It's simply that um, folks in those hum targeted humanities discipline have um, a bit more leeway, right? On how much US-based research they can propose to do on their non-US topic, right? So just, um, and if there's further questions about this, I can certainly um, clarify more. A um, couple of things that IDRF uh, does not support, right? Um, so we don't support uh, professional conference participation. And we understand for many folks, uh, especially the disciplinary conferences, it's part of your eventual um, professional development, but that's not, right? We're, we're, we, do, uh, we support research, not a conference presentation. So all of the appropriate disciplinary um, meetings and presentations would not um, be funded or permitted um, during the course of this research, right? So again, it's the American Historical Association, Anthropological, AHA, ASA, APSA, all of, all of those, right? Um, we do not pay tuition remission. Um, as I think I've made clear, perhaps through the six to nine months, uh, six to 12 months of continuous research, this is really not designed to be short research trips between the US and an international site. Um, it's not sort of two weeks or a couple, you know, a couple of months um, back, meet with your advisor, um, go back for two months, that sort of thing, right? It is seen as sort of immersed um, continuous, continuous research. Uh, we don't pay for transcription. We know this often affects anthropologists the most. Um, so sorry, um, but uh, we consider that and the selection committee considers that part of the work of uh, in your doctoral training. 
Um, additional research in a country already funded for significant dissertation research time. So first of all, to be clear, uh, we're talking about if you've already received uh, funding post ABD, right? So post ABD, you've already received support. Um, we probably want to know more about that. And there's a category in the application to address that. Um, so if it was pre-dissertation, if it was funding that you did, you know, that maybe it was connected to some to what you are still researching, but it wasn't funded, it wasn't, again, it was before your ABD, uh, that's okay. But if post-ABD, you've already received support for significant research measured by time and money, right? We're not going to re-up you for the same place, right? So perhaps you've gotten eight months of funding um, and $22,000 uh, to go uh, to go to Argentina. Um, and if you apply to us to go to Argentina, we will tell you, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not eligible, right? Um, so we're not, as I said, gonna re-up you for more time. You may feel like you have that lot much, a lot more research to do. You may feel like you didn't, you know, they, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's far more research to be done than I even expected. But if you have received essentially close to the equivalent of the IDRF, uh, we will tell you that you are ineligible. Um, again, on something like this, if you want to be absolutely sure, of course, email us before you apply, right? If you write and say, well, I've had 10 months of this and $30,000, and I, I want to go back to the same, same place, I can that guarantee you that we will say, no, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. Um, but we really do measure it on a, on a range of, again, of time and money. Um, so email us for, for clarification on that. This is different, by the way, than if you've been funded ABD to go do research in one country and you will have a comparative project or maybe even a comparative across national lines or even perhaps across regional. Um, so you may need to conduct research in another site, right? Um, another country. Um, perhaps you've gotten the funding for one, you can apply and obviously it's for the same, it's with the same project, it's your dissertation. You could apply to us, um, for the funding for the other for the other country or the other region right of research that is um, necessary to you right um, and that's also probably a good time to mention you know we will fund multiple countries within your six to 12 months right you can apply many people i mean pre-pandemic a full third of our applicants and fellows would um, propose to do and do cross-regional um, work um, so that's, you know, that's entirely within the range of what we, um, what we fund. Um, but the thing I'm asking you to be sensitive here to is whether you've had post ABD funding to go to a place already. If you've had significant funding, we will not fund you to go back to that place, right? <clears throat> um, so I wanted clarity on that. And also I think you've gotten it by now, but I do repeat this frequently because I want people to be very, very, clear about this. This is not a dissertation write-up grant, right? This is a research grant. If you have in your application some part where you're like, and then I'm going to spend three months writing up on, you get, you will be deemed ineligible, okay? So um, that is uh, not what we do, right? <clears throat> okay, now I want to move um, to parts of the um, application itself. Um, to be clear, and this is a surprise to no one, our application is entirely online. All of you at US-based institutions would be familiar with this process of online um, applications and portals. Our portal is open, as you all know, that's how we got your info, um, and it's live. Um, so good for you for, for already starting, right? Um, you have perhaps already seen parts of, of all of this, right? So. Some of this will be familiar, even better, right? So of course the application form, which I'm imagining is the part you might be most familiar with. Um, so right with contact info, obviously um, we have um, relevant coursework, relevant research, relevant studies, relevant work, um, language self-evaluation, all of those things are part of sort of a form in addition to the abstract, which I'll explain a fairly important role the abstract will play. Um, so that's all within the application form. Um, if for some reason there are folks who are joining us who haven't yet gone into the portal, um, I urge you to do so, but also we do have a PDF on our website um, so you can see the, the form of, of the application. Um, 
you know, these next three things, I'm going to um, devote a, uh, a slide to each of them. So let me just bracket for a moment, the research relevance, the personal statement and the 10 page proposal, because um, we'll get back to those. Um, so let me uh, now just mention a couple of things about the two page bibliography. Um, and you can see my, um, my bureaucratic need to tell you already here, right? Some things can be tuple space, some things can be single space. So pay attention to those sorts of things as well. The two page bibliography is one of the things that can be single spaced. Um, this is um, just to give you, you know, a, a sense perhaps of what it might be helpful to think about um, as you're preparing a two page bibliography. Um, obviously, because it's two pages, it is not a full literature review. Um, so I think it might be most helpful to think of it as um, that these are the essential texts um, into which you are contextualizing your work, right? So here is some essential literature um, that relates to your, to your uh, research. And um, these two pages are saying something about uh, your scholarship, the scholar you are, the scholar you hope to be, the scholar you are in development, uh, where your research fits within, within um, these two pages of, of, um, of bibliography that you consider essential to sort of thinking about your, your work's place within it, right? Um, and so um, I will add to that often um, historians specifically um, put sometimes at the top even just sort of the most essential of the primary sources that they'll be um, that they'll be investigating. Um, so again, we get into some disciplinary distinctions about how people can present their stuff within a bibliography, but know that that's something that, that does get done. Doesn't mean you have to, right? But that is um, permissible. Um, and so another thing to think about is sort of um, who you, or what kinds of scholars you do include or don't, right? And so um, I think you're probably all familiar with, you know, sort of the, the way a bibliography like footnotes can be a shorthand to thinking about the scholarship you're reading, right? Like, oh, they include this person, not this person. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Um, and then in some small way, because it's two pages, that's what you're doing, right? So for instance, um, if you work um, on um, a topic that's based in Latin America, and the only um, scholars you cite in your bibliography are at US institutions writing in English on a US academic presses, um, that's sending a message. That might be the right message. That might be in fact the most essential people to you. And that's really all that you need to think about within, um, within the larger uh, bibliographical work on your topic. Um, but others might look at that and say like, okay, well, that's good to be clear um, that they therefore are not reading anybody um, from the region who's writing in Spanish on non-US um, imprints, right? So again, I'm not saying present, present something other than the reality of who you feel you are as the scholar, um, but you should know that there are sort of nuances to how people read it as I'm sure it is for all of you when you look at um, who is included or not included in other people's reference points, right? Um, so I just want to mention those things about the bibliography. Um, and then this last one before I go into the details on these top three, um, the language evaluation as it's noted here, if necessary. So nobody needs a language evaluation um, in English um, and nobody needs a language evaluation in their uh, native language. Um, and there are ways to indicate your relationship to a language um, on the application. So um, if you'll be conducting um, research um, in what you consider your native language or your family language, um, that will, you can write that clearly, right? You will list the language. If you have studied in school, you would, you would indicate that as well. Um, but then also sort of say, you know, uh, language spoken at home um, my entire life, um, again, in whatever way conveys your truth of, of the relationship you have to, to that language, right? Um, if you are planning to do research in a language that is not English and not your native language, um, you should get an evaluation for it, right? And we, um, we want an evaluation, um, ideally from a language instructor, um, ideally from a language instructor at your institution. A couple of things to say about that. Um, it's possible that you're doing research in a language um, that you've been instructed in, but not at the institution that you're currently at. 
Um, I will say after many, many, many conversations um, with deans and associate deans and people in charge of fellowships, a lot of different institutions, it is entirely reasonable and normal to approach a, um, a language instructor at your institution uh, for a language evaluation, even if you have not taken that language with them, right? So that is, um, you know, especially the more commonly taught languages, right? So, um, so, but that, I mean, certainly French, um, Spanish, that you may have learned it elsewhere, um, but you can still go to a language instructor at your institution and ask them to do a language evaluation. Um, a PDF of the language evaluation is also available so that you can see, right, um, that what's being asked um, are questions that, that convey sensitivity to the different kinds of fluency you might have in a language, right? In some kinds of research, um, you need more oral fluency, in some you just need uh, to be able to, to read. Um, in some, obviously, methods, you need combination. So all of those things are, are their own area. Um, of evaluation, um, and it will be be possible for the language evaluator to um, make judgments about the different kinds of fluency across different sorts of uh, language ability. Um, if you are plan to do research um, and would like an evaluation of language that is not taught at your institution um, or is rarely taught in the U.S., and certainly every year there's one or two, I suppose, in that situation, and get in touch with us, right? Um, that is, you may have a contact um, in another country um, that would be able to, to do this evaluation. Uh, so you can get in touch with us. I will say, um, it's it's. Um, I would say it's probably no more than two or so folks um, every year who require um, require that. But um, certainly, be in touch if you're concerned that you know this is not a language uh, that I know of an evaluator for. Okay, so I'm going to move on here uh, to these uh, specific other parts, uh, research relevance section, personal statement and 10 page proposal, right, so that, that meat of the, of the application. Um, let me first move um, right to research relevance, but I'm going to pause here for a moment as I explain it, because I think it's, um, this is where I would um, start to explain to you um, the, the tiered review process that we have, right? Um, and specifically because the research relevance questions um, play a role in that first tier of our three tiered review process, right? Um, so just a couple of blanket things to say in general. Um, we have in our three tiered review, um, everybody um, who will review your application in those three tiers are US based um, faculty. Right, who all um, come, they come from a range of institutions and a range of expertise. Um, we obviously try and get um, a balance of, of folks from different uh, disciplinary um, and departmental areas um, with different regional um, ex uh, experience, um, expertise, um, and obviously different thematic um, uh, foci. So all of your, when we say reviewers, and that's our blanket term for the folks who are involved in the three-tiered review system, they're all faculty, they're all scholars working in humanities or humanistic social sciences across the globe, right? <clears throat> so the research relevance questions um, play um, a specific role in the first tier of review. So let me just unpack that for a moment before I actually go on to talk about these questions, right? Uh, this first tier, what we call screeners, um, will only be reading the abstract and these three research relevance questions, okay? So that's another way of saying, pay attention to these, right? Um, that they um, play a significant role in moving from a first to a second tier. Let me also say, that don't get too worried about taking all the notes on, on what I'm gonna say about the tiered review system down because you will find this laid out for you in our FAQs and we have a link to the rubrics that we give to um, our, our reviewers at those three different tiers, right? So you will find all of that there. I'm just making reference to it now to give you a sense as I go through the rest of this, where, what roles it does play, right? 
So at this first round, as I said, the abstract and the three research relevance questions will be read. Um, this tier of review is blind, by which we mean um, the readers will not know your name, your university, um, your advisor. Uh, so also don't put that in, right? Please don't have that in your in the response to these three questions or in your abstract, right? Um, and it, it, and it, you read this, it, it shouldn't be, right? That we're not asking you in any of these three or in your abstract, what the university you're at or what who your advisor is, but we have on occasion had folks who do it and we're like, well, <laughs> there goes blind, right? Um, the point is we want your, your answer to these questions and your abstract um, to, to just stand on stand on its own, right? And that's that's all the, you know, just answering these is the, all the information. Um, I would say from the, the applicant side, um, this also means that you should not make assumptions about the area of expertise of the three faculty members who are reading you, right? Um, they will be assigned to you not based on um, your thematic area, not based on your region, um, not based on your discipline, right? So this is the broadest, in that sense, one of the broadest audiences that you'll have is for these three research relevance questions and your abstract, right? So let me go through these three research relevance questions, and then I'll fill in those other tiers of, of review, which again are available in our FAQs, um, so <laughs> don't worry, right? Okay, so the research relevance question, the first one, right? How does your research engage with methods? and approaches um, within your discipline? Um, I, I think for many folks, by the time you're it's certainly, you know, finishing up your application, you have a pretty good sense of the context of your discipline and the ways that your um, that your work um, operates within the traditions and the methodologies of your discipline, um, the the uh, sources of it, um, and things like that. Um, you should, of course, be really clear, like my discipline is right, and discuss the ways in which your work connects to it. Um, you may be in an interdisciplinary um, inter interdisciplinary discipline, um, which in many ways will make one, you know, one and two connected and potentially easier, certainly number two, right? Which is of course, how other disciplinary approaches, concepts debate inform your work. Um, so again, maybe you're in a disciplinary program, so this is gonna be an easier one for you. Um, but I should be clear, the vast majority of our applicants come from a single discipline, right? So please don't think you, you need to be in an interdisciplinary uh, pro program to you know, do well on this, right? Um, so really what, what we're indicating to you here is um, we want um, fellows who are, um, Certainly they're, again, I said, the majority are grounded in a single discipline, but we want fellows who are open, right? Open to the possibility um, that other disciplinary approaches um, can make them better scholars, right? That is, they are not so narrowly focused um, in their disciplinary ways um, that they cannot even imagine <laughs> that other disciplines could play a role um, in their intellectual development, right? Um, so um, again, sort of wanting folks who are open to this. Um, and I would suggest that if you don't, as you sit here, think of like, oh my gosh, how do other disciplines connect to anything I do, um, that you speak to people outside your discipline, right? That's not a bad thing to do in general, um, but to speak to uh, people outside your discipline, um, perhaps um, there are faculty who you know work thematically um, close to your topic, but from another region, right? Or vice versa, somebody who works in your region in your time period if you're an historian, um, but on a very different theme, right? That, to approach those folks and ask them, I mean, even ask them like, can I have a syllabus to your class? Ask them like, what are the top three things you would recommend um, I read on this, right? Um, and so to be aware of um, the ways that other Again, other disciplines could help inform inform your work. This is a brief thing, right? And it's not like we're not going to hold you to making sure. Oh, they said they would absolutely um, use uh, the methods of another discipline, right? We're not that's we're not requiring you to do that, right? We're asking you to engage in a sort of a thought piece, a very brief one, for thinking about the ways that other disciplines could help inform you as a scholar, make you a more nuanced um, scholar, right? <clears throat> Um, and then the third piece here, um, which I know is this really long question, right? Um, and perhaps by now all of you have a sense of like, oh, right, this could be one of those areas in which um, the funder, right? Or the interest of the funder is making itself known here. So again, 
if you didn't know before, you know, because it's like the third time I'm saying it, <laughs> that um, the Mellon Foundation is uh, deeply interested in supporting the humanities, right? And I can assure you, you do not need to be from the humanities to be um, eligible, <laughs> eligible or potential or to be a fellow, any of those things, right? I assure you of that. But what we are asking you here um, is to, to make common cause with the humanities in some way, right? I mean, this is in the most sort of, sort of <laughs> to said here, like, you know, capacious way, right? So what does it mean to be human over time, past, present, future, right? What's the most broad um, contribution uh, to the humanities that you could be making? So again, I know it's long and it's not, you know, it's not long in this attempt to <laughs> intimidate. It's actually there to convey really this broad view of the humanities. We want you to read, we're hoping with enough words, you will read yourself into thinking about this um, as it relates to your project, right? Yeah, as I said, it's conveying our funder support for humanities inquiry. Um, and what we're asking you to do here is really take an intellectual step back, right, from the specifics of your research. If that first question was more narrow to your discipline, the second one was like, okay, what about the, you know, the discipline on each side of you on a, on a spectrum? Um, and this one's asking you to take an even bigger step back, right? Um, try to think of it, um, Yes, it's an intellectual hoop we were asking you to jump through, but it's also sort of this liberating, like, right, what's the greatest thing I could, what's the greatest thing I can say about my research, right? And I think, and I hope that um, you would agree that really good scholarship should be able uh, to reach across a broad um, disciplinary spectrum. And I would argue even uh, across a, a spectrum that goes beyond goes beyond the academy even, right? So that's really what this is asking you. Um, how does this connect to something bigger than the specificity of time, space, discipline that you work on, right? So those re research relevance questions, as I said, the abstract are the things that that first tier um, of review will look at. Let me go on to other components of the application and then also within that explain the other tiers of review, right? So the second tier, is the we call reviewers this is like inside baseball terminology now um so at the second tier of review your full application will be read right so everything you're submitting right um so obviously everything the first tier review reads plus um your um the entire form as well as your 10 page um your 10 page proposal and the personal statement that I'll talk about in a moment, right? And in this stage, um, we will assign you a reviewer. Um, again, it'll be three. Uh, we'll assign you a reviewer who's within your discipline, but we will also definitely assign you a reviewer who's outside of your discipline. Uh, we'll assign you a reviewer who's within your region, but also certainly one who is not in your region. Um, and we try to, of course, match up uh, other other connections, thematic ones from somebody who might be both outside your discipline and your region, um, so that we get a group of three who we feel come at it from different um, different intellectual angles. Um, we get a lot of applications and we have a lot of reviewers, but obviously there's not, it's not gonna be like there's, oh, everybody has this perfect match, right? It's not gonna be your advisor reading um, your application. I mean, for so many reasons, it's not gonna be your advisor reading your application. So sort of be aware of, um, of this audience, right? Um, in your discipline, outside your discipline, right? In your region, outside your region, right? And balances of that. And in this, we'll be asking folks to, to look at your application um, and consider some specific um, areas, right? And I'm not gonna go through all of these. These are on that in the FAQs on that sheet that is linked there. So you can go and see them specifically, but it is things like, you know, the originality, the appropriateness of methodology, right? Uh, the feasibility of it, your preparedness, you know, your training to do this, right? Um, which includes things like language training, right? So there, there's specific questions that we are asking the reviewers at that stage to consider. <clears throat> they will read the full application. They said that includes the 10 pages, the research relevance, abstract, all those things, but it also includes for just the second year, um, a personal statement, right? And so that's what you see before you on the slide, um, a brief personal statement. And so just to, perhaps it might be helpful to let you know the context of um, why it's the second year of a personal statement. Um, in their most recent 
uh, renewal from the Mellon Foundation, um, IDRF, we recommended that we get rid of letters of recommendation and the Mellon Foundation agreed. And we wanted that um, for probably reasons that uh, folks are fairly familiar with if they follow <laughs> this, uh, this sort of thing, right? I mean, we wanted to uh, do away with the, the challenges of letters of, of recommendation in terms of implicit bias, um, in terms of prestige bias, uh, institutional gatekeeping. Um, and um, we are happy to have gotten rid of those things. Oh. I should say, <laughs> of the letters. I have under no illusion that we can all just get rid of, of those other things. Um, but we did consider that there was something lost by, um, or there was something, there was something potentially positive about those letters of recommendation um, that we thought was helpful to the applicant um, and to um, a reviewer's take on an applicant. Um, so they could be quite humanizing um, part of something that is mentioned in a, in a letter of recommendation that in a 10 page more formalized um, proposal, the applicant doesn't see a space to say something personal, something about their connection to their topic, to the community they're working with, um, to the area that they may be, um, they might be in fact, a a citizen of, but are conducting their studies in the United States. Um, and so we were hoping, and that's our idea for the personal statement, that this gives the applicant an opportunity to, um, to, to fill out um, the sort of more humanizing part of the application, but do it on their own, right? That you don't need um, a, an advisor or recommender to do that for you, right? Um, and specifically in conversation with colleagues in Native American Indigenous Studies, um, they made clear to us that an opportunity, a clear opportunity for an applicant um, to uh, indicate their connection to um, an indigenous community that they might be part of um, would be uh, something important to them. So that is what you see before you here, um, this opportunity to take, again, in, in, in not that many words, um, tell us a little bit more about how you've come to this, um, to come to this project. Um, and um, sort of the, uh, the nature of it, especially um, if you are studying uh, with a community, um, what is your relationship? Uh, how do you position yourself, right, in relation to the communities you study? So that is where the personal statement um, is, uh, and that's what that's about, us having that and no longer having letters of recommendation. Um, before I turn to the 10 page, proposal um, aspects. Let me just say too, um, to finish up on the on the tiered review, um, that the final the final tier of the review uh, selection um, is also it's your full application read by three other folks. So you know if you become a fellow, your your application has been read. Um, and reviewed by nine, nine scholars, um, where again, they'll, they will read all of it and we, will be, we ask them specific questions about the quality of it, um, the applicant's preparedness, uh, the potential scholarly contribution. Again, all of this available on our FAQs, so go there. Um, so the 10 page uh, proposal, I know I've mentioned this can be double spaced. Don't don't single space it, please, please, please. Don't send us eleven pages, please, please, please. Um, and obviously, part of saying don't send us eleven is um, this is about fairness too. We want people to have the same amount of space <laughs> to make an argument about their about their work. So if you send us eleven, um, that is unfair, <laughs> as, as one might say. So so don't do that. On that similar note, though, I also warn you against sending in significantly less than 10 pages, right? Um, if it's a maximum of 10 pages and you send in six, seven, eight, um, you could be um, sort of setting yourself up for interpretation by your readers that you didn't care enough to be engaged for 10 pages, or perhaps, um, you know, if you leave something, um, Underexplained, which is bound to happen with a 10 page limit anyway, but you had two more pages. Um, the reader might think, well, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't fully explain their methodology because they haven't thought about it or they don't know uh, or they don't care, right? So um, don't risk sending any of those messages. Um, and I would recommend you send as close to 10 pages, um, but don't go over 10 pages. Again, okay, make a 
I won't say that one again. Um, so components um, of uh, an IDRF proposal, right? And what you see before you um, are also things that are noted in our um, you know, evaluation criteria on our website. Um, and I wanna be clear too, this is not like some specific order that it has to be in, um, anything like that. It's um, people present things lots of different ways, but it's just different. Uh, what we would recommend um, in terms of components of an IDRF uh, proposal. So one, of course, is an explicit statement of your thesis somewhere, somewhere early on, right? Um, you know, whether um, depending on your discipline, you think of this as um, the questions you'll ask or the hypotheses you'll test. Um, you want to be, sh you want it to be clear what your thesis is, right? Um, and also, of course, that it's, uh, you know, a, an original research topic as is required of, of dissertations, right? <clears throat> um, you want to be clear. I mean, you want to be clear throughout it, of course. Um, clarity is really key to a good proposal in general. Um, and you want to be clear about what makes this original um, work. And of course, throughout this, the package is also what makes it important, what makes it fundable, um, what makes it what makes it yours. Um, I often note in discussing this that, you know, you have an opportunity, especially in the first paragraph, the first page, um, to really um, grab the reader. So I sort of, you know, shorthand of this is sort of like open strong, right? Um, especially that I said, first paragraph, first page, um, you're setting you're setting the terms of this research, you're setting the terms of this narrative, right? So set it up grab the reader and take them with you um, through the rest of um, your thinking through of this project, right? Um, so um, it doesn't mean, and again, different disciplines often have different traditions in this way. Some disciplines say like, ah, oh, set it up with a, a real sort of story or narrative in the beginning. Some say, ah, oh, this is a puzzle I'm going to solve. Um, but, and it doesn't mean you have to do something, you know, that comes unnaturally to you in terms of setting up um, grabbing the reader, um, but I urge you again, especially not to squander that first page, right? And they say, you know, at the end of the first page, a reader should not be thinking about the works that you've just cited of somebody else, right? Maybe eventually you should, you will cite the works of somebody else, right? All scholarship is really sort of has something to do, whether it's a critique or on um, or in support of or with the work of or an evolution of the work of others, right? But they shouldn't be thinking, oh, fill in the blank and I can say, oh, right, that, um, that Michel Foucault, he was, he was really smart. Boy, yeah, he really, that was good. That's not what they should be thinking at the bottom of the first page. They don't need to think about Bourdieu at the bottom of the first page. What they should be thinking about is this research, right, is important and I'm convinced and I want to see how this is going to play itself out, right? And even better, if by the end of your 10-page proposal, your reader's thinking, I want to see this book, right? Um, so it's a lot of pressure. I'm not saying that has to happen to every person who gets the fellowship in any way. Um, but think about um, your how you're presenting your work, how you're presenting that you are the person to do this, um, and all of that sort of packaged together, right? Um, connected to that is be um, don't use a term. Uh, a scholar of a different discipline would have to Google, right? That is, it's so important to like uh, to understanding your topic. It's in your title. You use it multiple times in the first in the first page, but you don't actually explain this term um, and say the four, until say the fourth page. Like you've kind of alienated a reader. And these again, these are not these are um, scholars, uh, U.S. institutions. They are they are doing this for the engagement, the interest in what the next generation of scholars is doing, right? So they are sort of rooting for you, and they are interested. Um, so do not alienate them by using terms um, that um, that a scholar of another discipline would not necessarily know. And this, you know, also falls under the uh, the advice piece of have somebody outside your discipline read it. I've mentioned this before in terms of those research relevance questions and getting some insight from those from other um, disciplines, but this is another example. Certainly your 10 page proposal, uh, get somebody outside your discipline to read it, right? <clears throat> um, so that first page, you're gonna be talking about your stuff, your research, the importance of it, the originality of it. But obviously as, as you move through the proposal, you know, you're going to address the, the research of um, the relevance of the research to concerns of your disciplines and potentially of other fields. We've given you like a little, 
um, primer for that in those research relevance questions, right? So this will not be a surprise, right? You know, of course you have to give due to scholars and theorists whose work you're, you're using or depend upon or disproving, right, for that matter. Um, not on that first page, you shouldn't do that. Um, but yes, of course, like your, your research isn't happening in a vacuum. Um, one of the things I want to mention in this context, though, is again to think about um, sort of the claims you're making about your work and thinking about tone and audience and all this. So you know the audience is scholars across the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Um, and so the other thing to be so the thing to be aware of then, I um, mean the tone throughout all of this is a kind of it's a bit of a combination of humility and boast, right? So you um, you want to be confident. Um, but not arrogant, right? Um, so it's a real balance. That's a hard tone. <laughs> um, again, I would say have other people read <laughs> read your application to try and think, you know, to get that um, audience feedback, right? Um, so on the one hand, on the one side of that um, spectrum there of like utter humility um, and being very humble um, might be you want to say, oh, right, well, I mean, I'm just, I'm filling a gap. Right, I'm filling a historiographical gap, and I would say no, 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 no. That's too. That's too far over on the humility side, right? Um, you filling a gap might be the shorthand that you and your advisor use in terms of understanding your dissertation topic, right? You might look at the the, the world of research that's um, that you know is adjacent to your work and say, oh well, there's work on this and this and this, but there's nothing on this. That's a gap. I'm filling that gap. But there's two things. One, IDRF's mandate is not to fill gaps, right? Um, it's to support the next generation of scholars, right? So it's not the most compelling way to sort of, sorry, pitch your work. But also, um, it's not. Um, it's it's it it sort of takes um, all of the interest away from it, right? That is, um, okay. So we're they're filling a gap. Well, I guess somebody has to fill the gaps, right? That's that's probably, I'm hoping, not why you're planning to spend months and months and months doing research and who knows what years writing the dissertation, right? It's not to fill a gap. So that's too far over on the sort of almost disinterested, humble side, right? On the other side though, I would perhaps warn people away from saying, you know, um, I will be writing the definitive history of European imperialism because you're not doing that, right? Um, no dissertation is doing that. No book, I mean, honestly, nobody's doing that. Nobody's writing the definitive history of anything. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty wide range in there between I'm filling a gap and definitive anything. So you're going for something in the middle. And again, that's a wide, that's a wide range. Um, so just keeping this in mind um, as you go through these components and think about your research and the work of others, right? <clears throat> Um, you do want in there, of course, some explicit description um, and justification of um, ex explanation of your research methods. Um, you um, you want to make sure that your methods really tie in um, to your thesis or how are these methods answering the questions you're raising in your thesis, the hypothesis you'll test, right, that these need to be uh, clear again to somebody in your discipline, but also somebody outside your discipline, what the connections of your methodology and your thesis um, work are, right? And so um, to be aware of language there too, don't just say I'll be, I'll be doing mixed methods, right? So what are those methods, right? How do they enter, enter into it? Um, if you're talking about, you know, doing, um, uh, participant observation. Well, wh what participant? What does that mean? Um, what kind of what kind of um, organizations, peoples? What was what what, um, what aspects of it? If you're saying I'm doing surveys, I mean, what right? You need to be explicit about those things and what they mean. Just like if you say I'm looking at the archives, looking is not going to stand in for a more full methodological discussion, right? So you need to really be clear about explaining those specific methodologies and how they actually get to your thesis statement, right? Um, so again, connecting methods in the thesis um, and how they answer the questions, uh, how they answer the questions you raise, right? If you've done preliminary research, um, that's great. It can often be somewhat easier to um, to make arguments about why you need this time um, and what you might find there. Um, many people haven't, and of course the last year and a half would have been 
particular challenges to doing any pre-dissertation research. Um, so for everybody, right? I mean, just do what you can, do whatever legwork you can before um, beforehand, before you write up that part um, of your proposal, right? You know, is it is it contacting organizations um, that you um, want to have a connection to, um, people that you want to um, interview, you know, reach out to them. What, what, what number of people might you be able to reach out to? Um, if you're doing archival research, you know, contact archivists. Um, you can look at index of holdings, right? Um, so all of those kinds of things, the questions of access that you can do from the space we are all occupying these days, um, you should do, right? Um, and of course, this connects specifically to that somewhere in there, you know, you're going to want to have a specific justification um, for the proposed um, site specific research. On the application itself, perhaps some of you have already seen, you know, there's a pull down of the place, the amount of time, that sort of thing. And so this would simply be a, a, a um, you know, an elaboration um, on the kind of, um, the kind of specific site specific research that you are being, um, you're, that you're asking us to fund, right? Um, a couple of just more general things too. Um, look, we know you're filling, and, and reviewers know you are filling this out. I mean, in some cases over a year before you're actually gonna start this research. Um, so as you fill out the like, well, I think I need six months here and six months here. Um, don't become too concerned that, uh oh, what if I get there and I need five months there and seven months there. Um, we will work with you on that, right? We're not, um, we're not trying to second guess the requirements of your research once you're actually out there doing it. Um, then beyond that, I mean, I think, you know, you wanna leave room for, finding something different than you expected, or frankly, than you claimed you might find um, um, in your proposal, right? The, the proposal, as I've said um, to other folks, is, you know, it's not the final draft of, of anything. Um, the proposal is a, is a speculative <laughs> work, right? So, um, you know, we want to also make sure you're a scholar who's actually open to finding the thing they're going to find as opposed to the thing they want to find, right? So um, that's another way of saying, you know, don't don't present your hypothesis as a foregone conclusion, right? Um, leave space for um, finding um, finding something else. Um, and then finally, and I guess this is just like a little tidbit of uh, recommendation advice. Um, you know, um, don't let the the need for scholarly language um, in a ten page proposal utterly still the passion <laughs> that you have um, and the interest that you have for your topic, right? Um, there's a reason you need, you want to do this research, you need to do this research, you are planning to spend many years on this topic. Um, you must have passion for this. Um, so let that come through a bit, right? Um, obviously there's, you know, certain sort of pro professionalization of language um, that um, you're all well versed in already, um, but um, we've also all read authors on topics often that we don't know at all um, and are sort of moved sometimes by um, their clear um, passion and enthusiasm for a topic. So um, think about that aspect. Think of how you've been as an audience for the works of others and thinking about, uh, thinking about that voice. <clears throat> um, Okay, so then just sort of final, final things to leave you with here. Um, and this is, say it's really a cheat because the first three are kind of the same thing, right? It's a multi-tier review process. It means there can be reviewers with a wide range of discipline and regional perspectives, which also means that you should avoid disciplinary jargon. And it's hard because by the time you're using it, it doesn't seem like jargon. It just seems like this is how one writes and this is how one speaks. So as I've said for a number of other things, you know, it would be really helpful to have someone outside your discipline, outside your immediate area, um, you know, outside your grad seminar, read it, right, um, to give you a sense of like, oh, that, that's, I didn't really understand what you're saying here, or that's not how we use that in, you know, my discipline or something like that. Um, adhering to guidelines, everything from 10 pages, no more, um, single spacing where you can single space, double spacing where you can double space, those sorts of things. Um, take the selection criteria seriously. So as I said, the number of things I mentioned here about our selection process, again, is available online as well. Um, the role of research relevance questions, all that sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, submitting for the deadline, please, please for your own peace of mind so that you don't have to worry perhaps about um, 
uh, technological problems. I don't know, internet goes out, natural disasters that are happening more and more. Um, so urging you all uh, to, to submit before, um, before November 2nd at 9 p.m. So um, that's, um, I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen um, and we can move on to, um, to questions that you may have. And I think we're going to structure this um, with my colleague Elsa, perhaps has already started to scan these a little bit, <laughs> but we should give her a little time um, and then um, sort of um, figure out which, which questions would be most appropriate for us to address. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Elsa Ransom. I'm the Assistant Director of the IDRF program. Um, I just wanna say that what I'm gonna do here now is read the questions that we have in the Q&A for Daniela to answer. There are a few questions that I thought were more person or individual relevant. So I answered them already. There may be more questions that I answer that way. Um, but the questions that I think are, are sort of more broadly relevant are the ones that I will have Daniela um, respond to. So the first question, um, will reviewers have access to the demographic information that we put in, such as gender, race, ethnicity, while re reviewing application materials, asking this specifically because they are thinking of how to address safety and accessibility of places based on gender or race? So um, um, our, our uh, reviewers um, do get, um, so in past years, they have gotten aggregated information um, on, on that about our applicants. Um, and SSRC in general, I believe, is moving towards a model in which people are more aware and given the information on individual applicants. Um, so, um, so that's a halfway of an answer. Um, but can you repeat that second part specifically, Elsa, about the access to and safety? Um, well, taking slight liberties with the question, I think um, they have they want to know how it is they address in the proposal um, issues of safety and access for uh, for what it is that they want to study, and how do they address it, and will reviewers specifically be able to see from the application, oh, this is a... Yeah, whatever. but all of that you can certainly, and we've certainly had past applicants um, be specific about that, right? The, the challenges, there might be different challenges um, for people of different gender identities. There might be different challenges for people of different um, ethnic and racial um, self-identification. Um, and so um, you, I mean, I think as an applicant, if you need to address th those questions of possibility and access, you should be as clear as you can, but and as clear as you want to be um, about those challenges and the way that you could possibly mitigate um, and have and be safe. I think that gets to it. Uh, so this is a question about um, the targeted humanities for somebody who is studying religion, say, um, but not in a religion department. Can they claim religion for the three month funding? Um, aspect of that discipline. So, you know, this is the sort of thing where you might want to be in touch with us specifically and send us this information uh, because by and large, like we're either going on d department or discipline. And if neither one of those are in those targeted humanities, that's going to be uh, difficult for us to see um, because obviously people use, you know, people can say, I, oh, I, I'm in this department, but actually I'm an historian, um, but we're not talking about methodologies, right? This is, we're not making distinction around that designation around methodologies. Um, and obviously there are people across lots of different departments who use a range of methodologies. So if, you're, if, um, if essentially you're saying, I want to be able to take advantage of these targeted humanities um, protocols, um, but I'm not in a, formally in a religion department, then you should be in touch with us so we can, um, we can figure out, um, in fact, whether you'd be eligible to, um, to apply with those, with those designations. All right. Um, if we are, or someone's conducting international research, but the site uh, is closed to travel, um, but you do have contacts there with whom you can conduct research more virtually, is that something that would be allowable? 
So looking ahead to 2022, um, so starting if we are not in, I'm in a position at the moment to say we will we will fund remote research, right? I mean that's part of why we're sort of saying like um, that's not COVID. Uh, you don't need a COVID plan B. So ideally, you would be putting forward to us a sort of a regular plan for IDRF, and you would be requesting on-site site-specific research. So we're not uh, we're not changing uh, at the moment because of COVID. We're not changing all of our requirements and eligibility around um, funding remote research. Uh, of course, the reality is uh, for this last year's cohort, uh, we have allowed for some remote um, research because it's been a year and a half, right? Um, but no, for applicants of the 2022 um, to be eligible, you would have to be requesting on-site research. Is it okay to cite a scholar in text but skip that same scholar in the bibliography? All of that's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I would say you're saying like, oh, like what, what is so important? Like if, if a scholar is so important that you're gonna cite them in your 10 pages, why wouldn't you find them important enough to, again, thinking about this like two pages as the shorthand to think about what kind of scholar you are. Like it would seem to me that most people would do the reverse, that there might be people in that two page bibliography review that you don't cite in your 10 page proposal. Um, but in the end, you know, that's for you to decide if this is just a matter of like, I'm trying to sa save an extra line <laughs> um, uh, in that bibliography. I'm not sure it's gonna work that way because in the end people will look at your bibliography as well and will wonder where's this incredibly important person who you cited? Uh, why are they not in the bibliography? Um, but it's up to you. Uh, if you apply and are not accepted, can you revise and apply again the following year? Uh, absolutely. We have um, certainly, sorry, to many folks who um, did not receive it their first um, application round um, and, and reapplied and were successful. Um, and I would urge everybody uh, who's listening, um, if you do not, um, if you are not successful, to also get in touch with us because we might have comments um, to, uh, to give you from the reviewers. Uh, we might not. It's obviously a great ver you know, variety of responses um, from our reviewers and some write elaborate, uh, elaborate reviews and some do not, but uh, you should certainly get in touch with us and we might have uh, reviews that we could send to you that could potentially help you if you reapply or even if you, you know, don't reapply, um, that it could just be helpful feedback for you. Uh, the next two questions are about language evaluations. So I'm going to just combine them into one. Um, the first is if somebody is studying in a department of a language, do they still need a language evaluation for that language, even if, if it's not their native language? The second one is are language evaluations suggested or required for languages that are used in the archive, but not in person? So yes, if you if you are doing research in non your in not your native language or in English, you need we you should have a language evaluation. That includes if you are, I mean, I would say especially if you are in the department, um, and it would just it will just be that much easier for you to find somebody to um, to do the evaluation. But yes. Um, and then, um, yeah, archival research, you still need a language evaluation, as I mentioned, you know, evaluators, perhaps your spoken language is not great, but maybe that doesn't matter because you'll be reading it, right? And so language evaluation or evaluators will be asked in those different categories, but absolutely people who are doing archival research get language evaluations. Uh, how strict are the word limits for the research relevance questions? Strict, strict, yep. All right, um, so asking about the personal statement, uh, uh, that is also a, a positionality statement. Is this required as a positionality statement, even if they are, if the applicant is not studying indigenous communities? Uh, no, um, this was simply, I mean, the parenthetic part of like, if you're, if you are working on indigenous groups, as I said, colleagues in those departments wanted us to indicate that this would be the spot where many folks would want to um, explain their positionality, but you are not, um, that's not a requirement. Um, this is another question about the language evaluation. If a language evaluation has been submitted um, from another, from somebody in another country, 
do they need to get another evaluation from an instructor at their current institution instead? So if you've already, if what you're saying is you've already asked for and it from somebody outside the country and that evaluation has already been submitted. Um, okay, so look, we would prefer it to be from your institution, your home institution, if that's possible. Um, so I would suggest that you just email us um, separately. Um, and I'm not saying it's all for naught and it, it may be just fine, but um, you know, we usually accept those from non, um, non home institution based instructors or non US based instructors, because we've already been in dialogue with you about this and there's a reason and that language is not taught at the institution or it's not taught in any institution that you have any access to. Um, so we would just want um, to discuss that and make sure that 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 was the case and that's why you went elsewhere. Uh, when do you hear back um, about whether or not you receive the fellowship? Um, if you um, become what we first call a provisional fellow, which is just what we call it until you get all your paperwork in, um, you would hear back from us by April. Um, so yeah, like mid-April um, is when you would know if you were a fellow. Uh, if somebody has submitted an application already and uh, was rejected, should they acknowledge this and how they have built on reviewers' feedback in the present application? Um, so, I mean, there'll be like almost a, a housekeeping question from S from the application that says, have you applied for another, have you ever applied for the IDRF before? Um, you know, we like to, we actually um, tell reviewers because we do we do get pre-applicants that we feel everyone should be judged sort of fresh and anew on what it is that they're being um, and what it is that actually is being submitted. Um, so, you know, we don't know if you're gonna be read by a different person or different peoples than you were read by before. Um, so I would consider this, I mean, certainly if, you know, <laughs> if, um, if you got comments and you've taken them to heart and you think it's made for a better proposal, we're happy for you. Um, but I would suggest that you treat this as a new application again. You don't know what the history of your application with whoever will be reading it is. Um, and also to be clear, making the changes that were recommended is obviously, I will say this in a bureaucratic way, is no, um, is no promise uh, that you will get the get it this year, right? Um, but I would treat it as a, as a new application, um, I think, but um, again, I don't, I'm not, we don't want to micromanage how people apply to that extent. We micromanage the rules, but not the, um, not the um, sense that people might have about what would make for a better application. But that's my, that's my opinion. Sorry, I have to look at this a little bit. Of course, of course. Okay, um, how should somebody articulate problems about uncertainty in their own travel plans? So for instance, um, if somebody is uh, undocumented, um, though they anticipate they can travel, how do they put this into the application? So I think, I think to be honest, um, that's part of how you could use um, parts of the personal statement. Um, but um, beyond that, right, I mean, it, and I, I think you're referring to like the areas where you said, oh, you have a specific justification of research um, plans. I mean, I think you would, you could acknowledge it there, or you could simply, as, as I'm saying, everybody does, like put forward, this is speculative, this is, you know, right, this is what I plan to do, this is what, these are my uh, justifications for needing this amount of research time um, and knowing that there might be challenges in that um, is, is a bit more like the sort of thing we might um, just simply discuss with uh, a fellow if you are successful, right? Um, so um, again, this is up to you how you use the personal statement and what aspects of yourself you um, consider to be not necessarily um, part of the application. Um, so that's all up to you. But in terms of not being able to adhere exactly to the best case scenario of travel uh, is something that um, we 
we deal with in, in multiple ways. Um, so know that that's also just something you could deal with um, as it develops later. Uh, would IDRF be willing to fund a different city or cities in the same country um, when somebody has received significant funding for that same country? So that is, they would be going to a different city in the same yeah. country. Yeah, no, I mean, actually, you know, um, perhaps we are too tied to, to nation um, and region in this sense, and we'll see how, um, you know, we'll see if those things change. But no, um, if you've had funding to a particular country, um, if you had significant in the ways that I already mentioned that you would not be eligible um, for, um, for that same country in any part of it. Uh, my project advances a transnational perspective, which covers three locations, but I'm seeking funding to pursue research at one location in particular, i.e. the one where I haven't pursued on-site research yet. Should my proposal focus on that location and that location only, or can it instead focus on the broader multi-site intervention of the dissertation as a whole? I mean, it seems to me that this, this proposal is about your dissertation, um, so that you'd be presenting a very different thing if you were just presenting on one location. I mean, again, it would take a sentence to make clear that you already have secured funding for two other sites, and so specifically you're requesting funding, you know, you are planning on the idea to go to one place, but it's hard for me to imagine how you could present your dissertation fully and clearly without noting that it's, you know, a cross-national um, study. Uh, I am wondering if you can speak more about what continuous research looks like. Um, what if somebody needs to return periodically to the U.S. for healthcare reasons? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I said, our hope, our hope is, and ideally it's uh, six to 12 months of continuous whenever it is you start. Uh, we understand people have other aspects of their lives. People have different visa, uh, have different um, visa situations where they have to return to the US with some, with some schedule to regularize their visa um, and yeah, healthcare. Uh, so um, we will work with you on that if, um, if that is the case that you have you know, obviously overriding pressing, whether health or um, um, citizenship um, areas that you need to be, <clears throat> that you need to return to the US. Um, if research might take overall more than 12 months, should we re include all of the research methods um, of the whole project or only the methods that we expect to carry out during the duration of, of an IDRF fellowship? So I think this relates a little bit to the, the multi-sided question, right? I mean, I think in the end you have to present your project because that's what people will be um, evaluating, right? Um, and so it's like sort of there's two different parts here. There's your project and then there's the like the things that you're gonna ask IDRF to do, but you can't understand the things you're gonna ask IDRF to do unless you understand the full project, right? So um, I think it's related to that question. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the research proposal and the bibliography? Is the bibliography a compilation of the literature mentioned in the proposal? Um, no, not entirely. And of course, we just had a question about having a, a clear separation of that, right? Um, no, I mean, and I guess picking up on my answer to that, I mean, usually those folks who you end up citing in the 10 page bibliography do, uh, the 10 page proposal do end up in the bibliography only because. If you're, if you're using up their space in your 10 page proposal to talk about them, then it seems like they're pretty important, right? And so that it would make sense for them to be in the bibliography. Um, but no, beyond that, it tends to have, um, certainly um, also have scholars um, and works that, that are not cited in it. As I said, it's sort of like this um, grander, uh, you know, sort of contextualizing of your work within the historiography, within the, within the research that, um, with the scholarship that already exists. Um, can tables containing details such as sample interview questions, categories, informants, et cetera, be single, single space within the 10 page proposal? You know what, Elsa, you have to answer that one. <laughs> um, I, I, I was thinking about answering that privately, but I thought maybe other people would be interested in knowing too, but yes, the answer is yes. You can be <laughs> single space within the 10 page proposal within a table. Um, is an interdisciplinary approach expected to be emphasized in the proposal as well as in question two of the research relevance question? 
Um, not if it's not part of your work, right? I mean, as I said, question two, we're sort of asking, like we're, we're searching for folks who are open <laughs> to the possibility that um, other disciplines could, um, could be relevant to them. But no, we're certainly not asking you to sort of pretend to be in an interdisciplinary uh, program or to embrace methods that you are not embracing, no. Um, question about transcription um, and does and this person's survey tools need to be translated into two different languages. Would this fall under transcription or is this something that could be covered? Um, I mean, obviously it's, it's a little specific. So we, I mean, this is, and this is really a, a budget question, it seems to me. And as I said, we don't, we, you don't need to apply with a budget. So you would be talking about that methodology within your application, but uh, you know, the question of who's gonna translate it or if you're saying you need help translating it is kind of a budget question. Um, but that said, we, we certainly have some, um, we have given funds um, for um, specific help um, in, um, in, in research assistance that could, pro could probably uh, address that. Uh, is theology considered to be equivalent to religion or religious studies? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you would send us, you know, this is like a, something that would happen offline. If you, if you want to send us the link to your program um, that explains it, um, then then um, we can um, we can make a clear decision about that. It's hard to know what um, what institution and what program it is. Uh, will you fund people who start their research prior to July 2022, but whose research goes past the six month point after uh, July of 2022? So it's possible you've started your research before July 2022. You should know that if, you, if you've done significant research before July 2022, then you might be making yourself ineligible for the IDRF, right? Like if you're starting research now by July, 2022 and, RF, and, and you have funded research post ABD, by our estimation, you could be ineligible by the time you would be able to start this. Um, you know, we certainly have had folks who maybe have a couple of months of research um, and they're already at their research site in July, 2022. We will not fund anything that happens, including your flights um, before July, 2022, but it's also just simply a warning to make sure that you haven't done so much that we would consider you ineligible. Um, I have a question about mixed method research. For example, I'm doing a hybrid ethnography that involves virtual participant observation as well as in-person or spatial participant observation. Can I still apply? Yeah, I mean, again, it just depends on how much time you're applying for for that on-site site-specific research, right? So when we say on-site site-specific, we, we are trying to fund research that you need to go somewhere for, not research that can be done anywhere or for that matter, everywhere, right? So, um, and obviously, you know, we understand that the the, the ability to do and the, and the the fantastic part of it um, is uh, the sometimes the ease and the lower cost of um, remote research, right? But again, um, this is part of what I'm saying, sort of COVID aside, um, our mandate is to fund on-site site-specific research. So we don't fund remote research, right? If what you're saying is, well, I am doing some remote part, but I'm not asking IDRF for that funding, um, or you know some other complication of the question that that you know isn't necessarily there. Um, potentially, we would, and it, or if your if your on-site site specific research part is six months, um, then then you would be eligible, right? But uh, we do not fund um, uh, we do not fund research that could be done anywhere, everywhere. That's why we don't fund you know just doing stuff with um, um, uh, say data sets that are downloaded, things like that, right? Um, is the bibliography section meant to be an annotated bibliography? No. Um, if my language instructors come from another institution in the United States, would their evaluations be okay rather than language instructors from my current institution? Yes, that would be fine. 
Um, I have a question about whether we should include a section in the 10 pages addressing security safety issues if the, if the country we are applying to do research in is designated as a level four or high risk for the Department of State. Um, and this is not, and this is because there are level four Department of State that are COVID related. So I just don't know if there's clarification on that. So if this is not, so if it's not COVID, um, you know, I, I, we can't say specifically what the threshold is for that you need further explanation for either security challenges of doing your research. I mean, this is sort of why I say, like, you know, you might think about what people also with not as great a knowledge. I mean, there are a lot of people who conduct research, you know, and other outsiders or people who don't know as much say like, oh my gosh, how can you do that? It's so dangerous. And those within say, no, 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 it's entirely possible. But again, keeping in mind your audience, right? Which is not just people working in your region and not just people, you know, doing the methods that you use. Um, if you think that audience would say, huh, isn't it kind of, I hear that there's a level four threat or there's all sorts of issues, then it might be something that you'd want to address. Um, a language evaluation question. In case of a multi-sided research where more than two languages may come into use, can I hire an interpreter in those cases when the need arises? Um, potentially. I mean, again, this is both this is both a this is now both a methods question as you might present it. Um, in your um, application as well as, as a budget question. Um, if what you're saying is you're planning to conduct research, um, but you yourself do, do not either have the proficiency or are not gonna get a language evaluation, if you're not gonna get a language evaluation, um, then you would definitely wanna address how it is that you're gonna actually do this research, right? I mean, this goes to the feasibility um, and, the, uh, and the training of the applicant to do, to do the research. Uh, so you would wanna address that in what there and have um, a viable plan for, uh, for doing it. The flip side, the other side of that would be eventually that becomes a budget question um, and whether, uh, again, we have um, a certain set amount that we could potentially give you for uh, research assistance and um, that could fall under that, um, that rubric. Um, but again, before you even get to the budget side, you'd need to address this as a method methodological challenge if you're not getting an evaluation and you're not doing that language-based work yourself. Sorry, uh, what form um, should the schedule of field, field work be um, presented in? Would it be in a table or is it in a calendar plan? People do all sorts of things and they do a narrative and they do a small table or um, it's up to you. We don't have a prescribed way. How specific must the research site be? Can it be changed after submitting the application? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can't be, oh, I was planning to do research in Argentina and now I'm instead going to Turkey. Um, I mean, obviously we have a requirement to fund what it is the selection committee said we were funding. Um, but as I said, I mean, if we're talking about like a, um, a smaller movement, both within like, uh, certainly within the region, but within the country um, and, you know, it's, or it's an addition of a, of a particular site that, you know, we assume enriches it. Um, or wow, it turns out, you know, I thought this place would have a lot of information for me and they don't and I hear or my research has indicated that it might be somewhere else. That's the sort of thing that as a fellow, we would work with you um, on I'm making that kind of change. And also um, at most we would ask for, I mean, assuming again, it still fits within the topic that you propose to study. Uh, we would ask for a letter of acknowledgement and support from your advisor if you were to make that change. Again, that would be as a fellow. Um, this is a question about the bibliography again. Um, should we be including published primary resources in our bibliography or is this just a list of theoretical references? It's up to you. It's up to you and this differs um, based on discipline, um, whether people put in primary sources, um, it depends. How many locations can I include in my application? Um, I would like to visit three or four different cities within the same country where the archives are, archives are located. Can I do that? I mean, you can certainly do that from a, you know, a, an idea of funding perspective. Um, and in, in, on, the, on the, you know, the pull down part of it, it it's not going to be, once you get to, I mean, you don't, I don't, you don't necessarily have to pull down a new spot for every um, different, say, archive in the same city. Um, but obviously, as it speaks to your methodology, um, it's something you would want to mention um, in terms of 
what what the researcher actually doing is. But uh, yeah, well, I mean, we certainly fund multiple multiple different visits um, within the same country. Does preliminary research for which I got funding count as previous research in the field that would disqualify me from the IDRF? Not if it's so. Again, the 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 disqualifying research that we're concerned about is um, post ABD research. Um, so that's the first measure. I, I can't. I don't know from the sentence whether the question whether it was pre. It sounds like it was pre. <laughs> um, but then beyond the post ABD part, it has to do with uh, how significant that funding was. So it sounds like you should probably email us with the specifics of that uh, so that you, that you can be sure. Sorry. Um, uh, somebody who is a target, a, a language instructor for the language that they are applying to do the research in, do they still need to submit a language evaluation? If it's not English and it's not their native language. <laughs> yep. Okay, I think um, I've come to the end of the questions. Um, I think there's maybe one or two remaining that basically the answer for that is you can reach out to us with further questions um, at our email address, idrf at ssrc.org. Thank you everybody for your questions. Okay, thank you everybody. Take care, good luck.